Thank you for being back, for filling your drinks, and for your silence in advance. In the last session, we were talking about a world gone mad, of a world that is not self-protective. Next up is a vision of what would happen if the world suddenly transformed itself overnight and screwed its head on. We have three liberal, evolved, absolutely gorgeous women, women on top of the game, women who've paid their dues to life, to as, as mothers, as wives, as lovers, as professionals, as creative catalysts, women who are wild, women who are wise, and women who are pulsing with energy. Between the three of them, there are way too many awards and way too many accomplishments to get into that. But I'm just going to name a smattering of their creative canvas for us to remember just how much they've pushed the boundaries of creativity, of ideas of being women. And because the ideas of being women affect society, it's really their work has affected society as a whole, made new spaces for expression. So just look at Ankur, 36 Chorungi Lane, 15 Park Avenue, Paroma, Zubeda, Nine Parts of Desire, and that's not even a fraction of the work that these three glorious women have put together. So today we're here to speak to them about the particular alchemy that happens when three powerhouses get together and make a film called Sonata. But it's also about that great and ever intriguing subject, which is women's friendship, the power of women, the idea of feminism, whether it indeed is, is a special thing or whether it's got ossified into a stereotype, whether feminism has lost its mojo, whether the new generation is as liberated as the old. And Jane Fonda once said that female friendships is what kept starch in her spine and helped her stay standing. She said that women's friendships pass hormones onto each other, which creates a sense of health. Is that true? Is that what happened with these three women? That's only a bit of what we're going to talk to them about. We're going to talk to them about creativity, women's friendship, and politics. But before I invite them, before I even utter their name, let's see the alchemy of what they've put together in the film called Sonata. We're all in boxes. You, me, that woman in the window. Jews, Miss Typo. Why don't you make a list? <laughs> Cigarette, bad. Wine, bad. Hugging and kissing, very bad. What? What? Akash kande hotash shomu naije ko. I sway through life with. A band. Pet me. Sharp chutney. Gali, she can hear all right. Macro man and Siri. Only in their briefs. I wonder who gets to bet them. Not so loud. Someone might hear you. Here. Mm. Oh, not on me. I like the smell of my man. Will you please remove those glasses? Here. Oh, does he beat you regularly? So <laughs> He's really like a child. No, 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 no. It's a man woman thing. You won't understand, Aru. Plenty of wine. No, she must be taking me for a walking encyclopedia on pornography. <laughs> Bet. Now drink. Mm. Like it? Kadak. <laughs> but good. Have you drink? Okay, okay, okay. Babuji thire chalna, pyar mein zara sambhalna. What awful creatures we are. No commitment, no aim. No ideology. We're not even feminists. People have accepted me for who I am, and if I can't talk about it, then who? Who the hell was looking at his profile, yar? With those thighs, <laughs> Are thunder thighs. You hijacked my life for what you call summer war. Thulan, I'm afraid of you. What? Love doesn't last all one's life. I believed that then, and I believe it now. His eyes still burn with the same fire, now mixed with pain. Because I could not stop for them, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held just ourselves. 
and immortality. Ladies and gentlemen, Aparna Sen, Shaban Azmi, and Lilith Dubey. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much for being here. As I said, this is a vision of what the world would look like if it had its head screwed on right. You know? <laughs> so, Aparna, let me start with you. Uh, we'll start with the film, but we have a vast canvas to cover. There's a delicious line in that film, which, which is what it ended with, which is to say, we have no commitment, we have no aim, we have no ideology, and we are not feminists. <laughs> Wonderful. You know? So please tell me, what are the women in, these, in this film about? And secondly, from at least what I've gathered, all three of them are unmarried. Is this why they look so happy in the film? <laughs> you know, she's answered the question. <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> what can I say? Shoma herself answered her question. But um, what was the question again? In all this laughter, I've forgotten. <laughs> no, I was asking you that it's a really delicious and intriguing yes, line. Yes, that it is. Th what, what is the three women's friendship about? What drew you to make this film? Well, uh, I had seen the play as a stage production. And I was very, I was really captivated by it. Because it's in one location. Uh, it was a one and a half hour play by Mahesh El Kunchwar, who's a very well-known Maharashtrian playwright. And, um, you know, it was in one space. It, the time was the duration of one evening, and there were three characters. And yet, it just held me in its grip, because it had such a rich interplay of moods. It had uh, such wonderful, nuanced interpersonal relationships and uh, such layered characters. So, you know, it, for me, it was a challenge because it is a chamber piece. So the challenge is A, to make the, um, to do, get the production design, the art, just right. So that it doesn't, you know, the, the, the fact that it's in one space doesn't uh, bore you. Uh, the challenge is to do the choreography very well so that it doesn't seem static. The challenge is also to have the acting so good that um, all these emotions that I'm talking about, all these rich textured emotions come to the fore, which is why I have two great actors with me. And uh, it was just a breeze directing them. And it was, you know, it, it, it's such a pleasure to have you know, that was one of the temptations, to have two good actors with me whom I wouldn't have to direct too much and whom I wouldn't have to train because it gets very tedious for directors to constantly be training newcomers. You do know that all the other actors you've ever worked with, Aparna, are quickly uh, looking for suparis on you now, right? <laughs> <laughs> are these two are already. <laughs> okay. But Shabana, let me... Quietly threatened her that, I mean, Shabana, it's a given. That Not she has so to quietly be taken. either. <laughs> but I've told her that I'm sorry, I waited 16 years for you to call me for, to do a movie with you, and now I have to be in every movie. <laughs> so that's a kind of a threat as well. <laughs> so, Shabana, let me come back to that other question, which was that what really is the nature of the friendship in these women, uh, you know, in this film? Um, you know, it's, it's so refreshing again to see a women's film that's not seemingly out there to make a point. So what is the heart of the friendship between these three women? Well, they were in, in college together and they play off each other. You know, there's a certain shared history you have with people that you've uh, been together through college and things like that. And they live different lives. But when they come together, it all just sort of holds. What is really lovely about it that all the characters, all the three characters are 
individual in their own rights, very different, but also very similar, which is something that I sense when I'm with women, with women that I like, and I like most women. I, I feel that there's suddenly some kind of connect that happens which you can't quite explain. And I think that's what's uh, nice in this. And uh, firstly, just tell me how often have you seen a film about three women at our age being the protagonists of a film? That in itself is so delightful. That is what also drew me to it, you know, that this female bonding that you don't get to see. You get to see male bonding all the time. I don't know if men will watch this film. Please, I hope you will. <laughs> Just because we are not young chicks doesn't mean we don't know how to have fun. Well, Lilith, a little more about the film before we move on to you because the film is going to release soon yes. and we'll immerse ourselves in the film for itself. 21st of April. <laughs> Aparna, you're not behaving like the receding Bengali at all, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm not, I'm Aruna Chaturvedi. In the film. Oh, in the film, <laughs> okay. You had me foxed for a moment. Uh, Lilith, uh, from again what we gather about the little that one knows about the film, you're in an abusive re relationship, but you look ebullient about being in an abusive relationship. <laughs> I, I said you look ebullient about being in an abusive relationship. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the psychology of your character and you know that particular jour de vivre that you seem to have even though your husband or your boyfriend, clear, no, not your husband, your boyfriend clearly seems to be beating you. Uh, you know, what is the soul of your character? You know, the, all the characters in this film don't have one dimension. They have several shades, several dimensions. That's why it's such an interesting piece because it can hold you for so long. If they were just, they just had one aspect of their personality that was being shown, you wouldn't find it interesting. So she, she is a very strong, she's a journalist. She, what's lovely about all three of them is they, are, they might be saying we're not feminists, but they're very empowered women. They're independent, they do exactly what they want, they lead their own lives the way they want to, they earn their own money, and uh, so they might joke around and if they've had a couple of drinks and say we're not feminists, but if you see them from outside, they are definitely um, symbols of uh, independence. So this character, like all the others, I mean, in a one-liner, she may be a prude, very repressed. Uh, Shabana may be a whimsical, um, you know, sort of uh, happy-go-lucky, sort of petulant, sulking, many shades sort of person. But there are many, many other things. Similarly with this character, Subhadra, she is the one who is hanging on desperately to her youth. She's gone through men because she can't believe that her sexual life is over. So at all costs, you know, there are lots of women like that. We all know them. So on, on one side, in the workspace, she's extremely confident, she's very strong, she calls the shots, she doesn't take any nonsense. And on the other side, where her personal life is concerned, she just uh, becomes very vulnerable because she has this, this uh, desire, sweet bird of youth, she can't let that fly away. So she's just hanging on. And so at the moment, she's with a guy where she's convinced herself that it's good. It's just, you know, sometimes he gets mad and he, you know, he, he hits her and he talks badly to her. But what the hell? She gives it back to him. So that makes it okay, which of course doesn't make it okay. So it's very interesting because the, the sheer aspect that she could be lonely for the rest of her life. You know, this is an exploration which is very interesting for me. That we are bravely making choices of independence and singlehood and being singletons. But we have to pay the consequences of that. And those consequences can be very frightening. So sometimes we hang on to things like bad marriages, turbulent relationships, violent relationships, emotionally abusive relationships, because we can't bear the thought of the alternative. So that's what she is really. I mean, she's so human, I think. I thought it was very sad, very human, and she was very vulnerable. But when she comes here, as we do with our friends, you put all that away and you say, okay, but to heck with it and let's have a few drinks and let's forget all that. Let's remember the good times. Let's live a bit in the past. And so that's what's happening. That's why she's looking so happy because she's down many a drink and <laughs> she's having a good time. So we'll cheer to Glenn Levitt for that. But uh, just, you know, I'm going to come back to what you said, uh, uh, Lilith, about the consequences of independent women and professional women. 
and the, the riptide that flows beneath that in your own personal lives. And I'd, I'd like to come back to that. But just moving away a little bit from the film, it is about that women's friendship. And as I, as I said, Jane Fonda once said that that was the starch that kept her spine uh, upright. Uh, Aparna, would you uh, share with us some story like that from your own life where a woman really has been the starch in your spine? Do you have a friendship like that? Actually, I have uh, two or three friendships like that where um, I, I feel that women really do sustain one another through bad times and good. And uh, that has happened to me too. I have had a lot of problems in my personal life that I've only been able to overcome, not only through my own efforts and my strength or whatever, but also in the knowledge that these friends are there like bedrocks. This is, this is such a wonderful thing. I mean, they've been there. I've known them, some of them I've known since I was in school. But uh, would you name some of them? I think Shabana is one of them. Shabana has not been with me since school, <laughs> but she's been with me since Sati, which was uh, 86. 86. So that's a long, long friendship. Um, yeah, and I've confided a lot in Shabana, and uh, she's given me a lot of strength. So has another friend called Sartaj, who lives in Bombay. Um, you know, these friends you would not uh, know because they're not all celebrities. But uh, just as Shabana has many friends like Parna, who is like a rock. You know, the, this is all there. I have a very good friend who is our acting coach, whose son is now very ill. When I heard that he could be dying, the first thing I did was go over and say, I'm staying with you now. I'm staying with you for a while until he, uh, he comes, comes out of the, uh, you know, the danger zone. But that is nothing great that I did that she would also do for me. And this knowledge that they're there, that they're there right through thick and thin, that is a wonderfully empowering knowledge. Don't you think that women have such complexity, especially emotional complexity, that that can only really be shared honestly with another woman? So when you're in a moment of great trauma and crises, I don't think uh, you can really share it beyond a point with any man may it be your best friend, your lover, your husband, you do need, you need those pillars which are just women. Shabana, do you buy into that, that there is a particular quality to feminine friendship? And would you share something beyond the fact that they're just there for you? One, do you buy into it? And two, is there some really quality experience you've had which can explain what is that particular friendship? No, I, I don't know. I think that when, but I have a very close circle of uh, friends and I enjoy being them, with them so much because you can be yourself and you can be as flawed as you are and you're not being judged, you're being taken for who you are. I'm often fond of saying that the ideal situation would be if women lived together and were visited by men. I think <laughs> men would be very happy also and women would also be really, really happy. It would be a very nice situation. Well, I would love that. Well, uh, you've accelerated me into a part of the conversation that I would have held for later. But I just want to share with the audience that at least two of these women I know, I'm, I have to ask Lilith whether she's one of them, both believe in airport marriages. Uh, they both have husbands that they meet, uh, you know, intermittently and that they believe is the formula for their great marriages now. <laughs> so My husband is back now for good. <laughs> Why is there a note of slight regret? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, he's actually, he's pretty gorgeous. He's there on the trailer. Yes. But um, it, when he lived in America and I visited and he visited, there was that lovely <laughs> anticipation that has gone. <laughs> but in fact, Shabana, you've also said uh, facetiousness apart. Uh, you know, do you actually think that marriages work better? You know, you and Javed actually meet very little in airports, but there's a, there's a kind of stream of friendship very clearly running through your lives. You, you know, know? Javed is very fond of saying that Shabana is such a good friend of mine that even marriage could not ruin our friendship. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the perfect thing. It is really a deep bond of friendship. And let me disabuse you. You know, a lot of people come to me, and particularly young women, and say, your husband writes such romantic poetry. He must be so romantic, na? 
he does not have a single romantic bone in his body. <laughs> and when I tell him this, he says, listen, if you're working in the circus, and if you're a trapeze artist, <laughs> So that's why I'm completely <laughs> deprived of that romance, let me tell you, <laughs> to take it. Well, we've, we've kind of, we've had almost the entire Akhtar family here. We only have to run through Zoya now. But we've all, I have been at the receiving end of Javed Saab's caustic tongue. <laughs> and I feel honored for that. You know? so, um, but, but let me shift gear a little bit. Uh, Aparna, we, you know, Lilith spoke about the consequences of being a very uh, successful, professional, independent woman. And you've been that. But your marriage failed early, uh, early on in your life. And it, there are people that you've spoken to about having a deep emptiness, a kind of loneliness in your uh, heart, even while you were scaling all the professional heights necessary. And um, also that there's a kind of, there was a kind of irritability inside you, you know, even while you were succeeding. W would you come back to that absence of male companionship or is it marriage per se? Or was it just to ha having to be on top of uh, everything, which is what is always asked of for women, that they be on top of their game as mother, as professional, as everything? You know, um, there were times that I really felt that I was stretched very thin, that I was being torn in so many different directions all the time. Uh, mother, wife, uh, friend, uh, professional. <clears throat> demands, demands, demands. There was a time when... You know, I just answering um, letters or phone calls or texts just to say no was taking up almost my entire day. And when was I going to do any thinking? Or, you know, you, your mind needs to be in a state of free flotation for creativity to happen. You know, so people say, okay, you know, you just need to come for 10 minutes. Nothing happens in 10 minutes, nothing. Because you have to dress for the event, you have to get there, you have to be there, smile, be photographed, all of that. And then you have to come back tired and by the time you come home, you're in no condition to even think of anything. So the less successful you are, the easier it is to be creative, I think. Otherwise, your, the demands on your time are so much and so strong. And then people just blandly smile and say, well... That's the price of success. <laughs> I didn't want it that way. Of course I want my films to be seen. I want them to be seen and loved and applauded. But it would have been nice if I had been faceless. Behind it all, somebody directing it and getting all the uh, kudos or whatever it is, but without being uh, seen. Now that created irritability in me at one time. And I had a foul temper. I was always feeling guilty that I was not giving my children enough time. But you know, I've learned to make my peace with all that to a large extent. I think it's just maturity. Thank you for sharing that facet of being a successful woman. You know, it's not something that society encourages you to speak of because you have to always be well turned out and, as I said, with all your T's crossed. And I'm going to come back to another phase of your life as a woman a little later, Aparna. But Shaban, I wanted to come to yours, you know, perhaps one big challenge for you, uh, again, as being a woman, a feminist, all of that, was that you fell in love with a married man. How did you, uh, you know, cope with that, your duty to yourself uh, to protect your love and, and your, your chance for happiness, uh, the, the world's opinion of that, your own sense of solidarity to another woman? How did you work yourself through that minefield? What did you tell yourself that made it okay? You know, it's a very, very difficult situation. It's a very difficult situation and only the three people involved know the pain that you go through when a situation like that occurs. And in my case, I knew that because people recognize that I'm a feminist and I talk about women's rights, it's going to be seen as a letdown. And people will say, but how can you take away another woman's rights? And at that particular time, I think the battle uh, that I had to wage with myself was, do I explain myself? I felt obliged to explain myself because I felt I owed it to people who have a certain image of me and felt very badly let down by that. 
but then i figured that if i explain myself it would only cause more more hurt there were young children who were involved and it would it would end up hurting a lot more people already the situation was very painful so i just decided to duck it and i just decided to lie low and i'm very glad i did it because today i share a extremely healthy relationship with honey and what i give her deep credit for really really credit for is the fact that that their uh, marriage ended in divorce uh, javed and i got married but never once did she let it color the children's uh, view of me and she shared them with me that only happened because that very painful period i just ducked and didn't talk about so it's it's a personal choice that you have to make it's very difficult and and shubhana you just mentioned about this idea of being a feminist and lilith i'm going to come to you to ask you a little bit about that but do you really i mean would you be able to even articulate what being a feminist means to you did it mean something some decades back and has it changed has it evolved and a secondary question to that is that does being a feminist mean that you buy into the idea of marriage which is really a very patriarchal concept in the first place does it really mean automatic solidarity to another woman right or wrong what for you would be the meaning of feminism today and is it different from years back you know i grew up in a family where equality for women was a given my father wrote a poem 60 years ago aur aap ijazat dein to main uska ek band aapko sunati hu jisme wo kehte hain ki zindagi jahad mein hai sabr ke qabu mein nahi udne khulne mein hai nikhat kham e gesu mein nahi jannat ek aur hai jo mard ke pehlu mein nahi uski azad ravish par bhi machalna hai tujhe uth meri jaan mere saath hi chalna hai tujhe you see at a time at a time when it was believed that you know men go out and struggle and women stay at home and look after the family and things like that he also said qadr ab tak teri tareekh ne jaani hi nahi history has not recognized your worth qadr ab tak teri tareekh ne jaani hi nahi tujh mein shole bhi hain bas ashfishani hi nahi tu haqeeqat bhi hai dilchasp kahani hi nahi teri hasti bhi hai ek cheez jawani hi nahi apni tareekh ka unwan badalna hai tujhe uth meri jaan mere saath hi chalna hai tujhe so for me it's just i mean 60 years ago it's really really amazing and he was a man who practiced what he preached his relationship with my mother one was one of total equality uh, how i was raised how he treated his daughter in law all of that so i was i think about 19 before i even realized that what i took completely as a given is not the case that it's the exception rather than uh, the rule that came as a very big surprise and then you know slowly when you're working when you're working in films that are talking about social justice and issues like that some of the residue of that uh, also gets uh, included there, there there was a time when i was doing films just happy in the knowledge that i was getting very important roles and these films were being very very successful and um, then i remember i went for a seminar where i was really attacked uh, and i was told how could you possibly work in a film like thodi si bewafai i said why i had an equal role to rajesh khanna why not and they said but there's a sentence in that that says the husband says to the wife uh, that itna yaad rakho ke pati ke ghar ka dukh bhi maike ke sukh se behtar hota hai and that you bought into it and it came as a real shock to me and i said of course i haven't even looked at it like that so then it started getting defined then i did a film in the early 80s called arth um and what happened after that film was suddenly i had women come into my house uh, not as fans to star but in sisterhood expecting me to resolve all their marital problems and that was very frightening because i was merely an actor and i was doing a job but then that made me aware that it is important because often times people mistake the character and the actor and so the solidarity with women started taking a different uh, shape i think feminism is vital 
to who I am. And there is this sort of coyness about recognizing yourself as a feminist or claiming that you're a feminist because people feel, oh, this is the bra-burning person, this is the woman hater. Now, we have to realize that the women's movement, when it came in, was asking for an overthrow of the status quo in what is a basically patriarchal world. And so some of it was very strident. And some of it took the form of saying, I will wear no makeup, I will burn my bras, I'll do everything that is recognized as feminine. Over the years, with greater maturity and with more space, because actually what you're asking for is negotiating more space for yourself. And within there, there are so many layers. Firstly, there isn't an ism that you can say, only if you do this, you're a feminist, you know? So over the years, my notion of feminism is one that is very inclusive of men. I don't think it's at the cost of men. I don't think that it is necessary to be uh, hateful of a particular uh, section of people because I believe that it is together, shoulder to shoulder, that we can really take society forward. So it's changed in that way. And the bedrock... I expected you all to clap, particularly the men. I'm going to give you five minutes to think, Shabana, but you'll have to say one thing more hatke than that, because inclusion and equality now are things that people find so, you know, it, it is understood and taken for granted. So just that one layer more that makes feminism even more complex than... Uh, you know, because as you said, so many generations have fought for that, that today the idea of equality is at least something that is pretty much taken for granted, whether it's practiced in practice or not. The idea is at least fairly embedded. But what further layers has that created? I'll come back to you for that. But Lilith, I wanted to ask you that you've said somewhere that your generation, you, you speak of yourself as the child of the 70s, that it was more free-spirited, more adventurous, and that bizarrely, at the fag end of so many women's movements, so many social movements, that the generation today is much more conformist than perhaps uh, your generation was. And, and one minute before we came here, we were all looking at a video where there was a young woman really speaking about sexual rights. And in that, she was speaking about wearing less clothes, you know, the right to wear less clothes. But that question always intrigues me because there are very many feisty women across the world and three of you to begin with, who are completely dressed from head to toe. Whereas today, a lot of independence of being a modern woman has got associated with just the right to wear less clothes. Do you think that there's any correlation in that? And my earlier question about, you know, whether you feel... Two, two main thoughts. Whether the, whether the new generation is more conformist and whether the idea of clothes is really intrinsic to whether a woman is free and independent or not. Uh, I think we were a certain way in the 70s because of the climate. You know that. We belong to the beat generation. We belong to a generation that was coming out of the post-depression after the war. It's all connected socially, politically. So there was something in the air uh, that made us the way we, we were. You know. Uh, so I think that we are always influenced by what is around us. It is not just an uh, individual thing. We are products of, uh, of a time. So I think very much that we were fearless. There were three things I can tell you which I feel very strongly when I look at today's generation. You know, whatever we look like, we thought we were great. You know, we had no desire to full fill our lips and fix ourselves. And, you know, I mean, this obsession with perfecting ourselves is a very today phenomenon. I wonder why. Why do we need? Because it's an endless process. I see young things around me and they can't stop. One minute it's the mouth, then it's something else, then it's the jawline, then it's something else. I mean, I've been told my jaw is an okay. I said, what the hell can you do to your jaw? Do you hammer it and break it and remake it? What happens here? So this kind of obsession with um, uh, sort of perfect beauty, the perfect look, it's, it's, it's psychologically damaging. It reduces your sense of self-worth. I laugh at and I tell my children, they are not like that, but many of their friends, that, you know, I'm so amazed at myself. I'd walk into LSR, you know, wearing clothes off Sarojini Nagar, because my dad was in the government, so obviously you couldn't afford anything very much more than that, with nice boots, and, you know, we thought we were hot stuff. 
and we had no idea that you know we had to fix ourselves or wear Louis Vuitton bags or do this or do that. There was supreme confidence, and I think there was a sense of adventure. There was a sense of fearlessness. There was a sense of maybe unwarranted confidence, but it was wonderful. The climate was like that. You know, my friends, people around me, if not my friends, were Amitav Go, Shashi Tharoor, lots of people who who just flew, you know, with it, and lots of women, lots and lots of women. So. But strangely, even in that period, I remember after about a few years when we looked around, we were 10 very good friends in first year. When by the time we'd finished MA and were doing, I was doing my second MA, many of them, uh, within about five, 10 years, out of 10, five got divorced in that period, okay? So that was happening also. Now, the big difference was, I think, that, um, Today, A, it is a very physical thing I'm talking about, but it's not just physical. My daughter is a therapist, and I can't tell you how damaging it is to have this kind of thing that you are less than, that you need to fix something, you're inadequate, you know. And instead of looking around, in our generation, I looked around at people like Aparna or Shabana and all, who were somewhat senior to me, and I said, wow, these are role models, you know. I mean, I'm inspired by them. They are my role models. I blame the media because the media is constantly talking not about a Sunita Williams, but about yet another story about some celebrity who has just done something very, very trivial and copious print is given to them about how they've done this or done that, which is irrelevant. Now, why aren't we promoting those models which are actually inspiring, you know? So I don't know, in our time, no offense, but there was no Bombay Times, and there was nothing like that. There was a regular paper, and you read the news for that. Uh, and you, you, your models happened to be writers. They happened to be some fabulous actresses, like Emma Thompson or Meryl Streep or whatever. And today, I feel the role models are very different, you know? And so, and the dressing, I don't care about the dressing. We were talking about a film of Judy Foster's where she was raped, accused. I think... To me, I'll give you an example. When my girls were growing up, uh, it's a very difficult thing to bring up two girls. They, uh, they were not brought up to be conventional and marry at 19. They were told, where we were talking about feminism, I come from a family where my mother did medicine, joined the army, uh, got married at 32, some, uh, some, I don't know, 65 years ago. And uh, she always told me, A, you are alone. B, men are good because you need kids. Otherwise, it's okay. You can do without them. And if she was alive today, she would have said, hello, IVF, fertilizing eggs. Now, though, we definitely don't need them. <laughs> so I come from a family like that. My father thought I should be at the least, he was an academician, a scholar. You sh I should at least be a nuclear physicist at the very least. You know? And I was wasting my time being an actress because what was that contributing to life? Life was serious, life was earnest, and, and theater was not its goal. So, um, you know, I come from a family like that as well. So I wanted to bring one point up because we were talking about how we were then and now. I think the, the beginning of how a woman is, is what happens to her in that home. Also, how that woman brings up her son. Today we go on and on and on, but it's Indian mothers who bring up their sons like that, yeah. who think they're in their hearts. Even my mother was such a, such a strong, feisty, independent, almost feminist, I would say. She had a, such a soft spot for my brother, you know? She loved us to death, but he had to just walk in and, you know, it was like, <laughs> ah. <laughs> you know, life was just totally different. And all he spent was like two minutes with her. We spent hours with her, my <laughs> sister and I, it was never enough. And when he came, oh, your brother dropped in today. <laughs> I said, what the hell is this about, you know? Yeah. And today, you know, I used to tell my daughters when they went out at night, I don't care if your skirt is this high, or this high. I mean, I wouldn't like it to be this high. But, you know, I want to know who you're with. I want to know where you've gone, who you're coming home with. And I want you to be truthful and hold yourself with dignity when you're out there because you have been brought up a certain way and your values have to be just completely, you know, so solid that nothing can shake them. I don't expect you to be virgins till you're 40 years old or 35 or whenever. That, all that is irrelevant to me. You should be protecting yourself because in this day and age, it is being a complete ostrich, ex 
expecting your children when I was so adventurous and you know in our <laughs> time we were doing hash and we were doing God knows what that now suddenly my children should be Sati Savitris and you know they should never look at a man like that and never have any sex and it's ridiculous absolutely so I think that it's very important how you're bringing up those kids and today yes if it's a sign of your independence but it should not be the only sign of your independence if I want to wear a pair of shorts that short you know, you have to take the consequences. If you walk on the street in Delhi and you're showing your butt and walking around, well, people are going to whistle, they're going to try and, you know, act funny with you, then you should be able to handle that. You can't have it both ways. You yeah. can't say, I want to dress provocatively, I want to show a lot of cleavage, I want to show my legs, and then I'm saying, why are these guys whistling? Why are they behaving so badly? You know, I mean, that also is a bit ridiculous. So I feel that clothes, it's a very so, small protest. If you want to wear it to show your independence, well, so be it. Be ready to handle what happens after that. Don't blame us that, you know, something happens to you. But I don't think that's the crux yeah. of it. The problem is much deeper. That the problem today with young people is not that. They are lost in a way we were never lost. And also they're re-evaluating everything. Marriage, relationships. You know, we, we, I used to say marriage is like, wearing a bandage and jumping off the deep end and saying, hope it all goes well kind of thing, you know? That's the best you can do. But these guys are not like that. They are evaluating, they're weighing, and they keep used to keep telling me that my daughter got married at 35 last year, and she said, look, mom, better happy and single than unhappily married. That is my mantra, you know? So, so that's what it is today. They're, they're a completely different generation, which most of it I find very interesting, especially the women, you know? They, they have affairs, they don't care, it's all right, they're like men in many ways. But this aspect that, you know, they're, they're, they're shaken to the core in some very fundamental ways uh, about inadequacy, that is what scares me the most about them. Sure. Uh, Shabana, you mentioned your father, you know, and how... <laughs> and I didn't even ask for a clap. By the way, that's, that's one aspect of female friendship, right? That there is an undertow of competitiveness saw, right away. <laughs> of course, absolutely. But uh, Shabana, it's, it's wonderful you mentioned your father because I was looking for some commonalities between the three of you. And it's fascinating that all three of you have had extremely liberal, you know, very, very evolved fathers. You all three have very feisty daughters or adopted daughters. <coughs> And another interesting fact about the three of you is that all three of you have either acted in adulterous films or at least been involved in some adulterous circumstance <laughs> in activity. Adulterous activities. <laughs> so I'm going to attack all three of those with, with great relish. Uh, Shabani, you spoke about your father. I, I'm going to come back to you to probe a little bit more about that, uh, you know, that uh, comment you made about equality and inclusion of men being the real bedrock of feminism. I just want to probe that a little bit further. But before that, Aparna, would you speak about your father? And Lilette, you as well, you call him a Renaissance man. But your father was a big, big influence in your life, Aparna, as well. Huge. Uh, was my, both my parents, actually. You know, um, I, it never occurred to me that there was something I really wanted to do that I, and provided I wasn't hurting anyone very much by doing it, that I couldn't do simply because I was a girl. It never even entered my head. I mean, it was much later that I realized, oh, these are some of the things that people say you can't do. I mean, uh, of course, we were protected also sensibly. I mean, it, uh, we were not allowed to come home by taxi alone at night. Yeah. That sort of thing we were not allowed to do. But my parents, with me as the eldest, were really also very young parents who were also experimenting, you know. Because my father told me, I think at the age of four or five, very wrong age, uh, to, uh, told me that, you know, you will be in charge of your own life. You will do what you want to do. We will not force anything on you. And I said, really? He said, yes. I said, can, then I can do what I want? He said, yes. I said, then from tomorrow, I'm not going to school. <laughs> and he of say course, yes to that? Uh, he said, 
okay, <laughs> giving him credit for being calm about it. My mother had started crying by this time. And my father said, uh, in that case, how do you propose to earn a living? So I said, why Kali Didi? She was uh, the maid. Kali Didi sweeps floors. I can sweep floors. So I thought sweeping floors was far preferable to going to school. But um, jokes apart, I mean, this, this, this was very early on in my life. But at every point of time, it was like um, they were protective. They didn't want me to get into trouble. But they, one of the things my mother said that I was saying the other day was she said, you know why I worry about you girls? Because you're essentially good. See, you have boyfriends. Now, please don't feel pressurized to marry somebody just because you've kissed or hugged him or even slept with him. Oh, wow. Don't your feel pressurized. <laughs> Ages ago. Because that is something that you won't be able to undo if you've had children. It, you know, they'd much rather teach me about protection and family planning than have me just go ahead and marry somebody because I'd happened to sleep with him once. And then I shocked Shoshti Broto, um, a journalist, maybe you've heard of him, because very early on, I must have been in my early 20s, not even, I mean, uh, not had children. And he said, what do, how do you propose if you have children to bring up? I said, well, I wouldn't say that don't uh, sleep with men because I don't think they listen to me. <laughs> but I will teach them about protection. This was then, you know, this became headlines and I was really, really, I mean, I went through a lot of uh, flack because of that, because of what I said. But these were unimportant things. Yeah. What my parents really taught me is that you're free to follow your dreams. That is what they gave me. What they also gave me was an enormous amount of experience and exposure. We were taken to um, music concerts. We were taken to see Shanta Rao, the dancer. I remember sitting here, sitting there, watching Shanta Rao do Mohini Atyam, and just the lines of her body evoked something in a 10 or 11 year old that made me weep. I was sitting there crying, and I remember my parents, when they saw that, they used to hold hands across me and squeeze each other's hands because they were so happy that their daughter was sensitive to this kind of thing, you know? It was wonderful. I mean, sometimes I wish I could give every child a childhood like that. And, you know, I feel really bad for children who are abused by their parents because, you know, the worst thing you can do is to abuse a child because that child is so helpless. The child is like a traveler who's just come and started on the way to life. And you can't damage that child like that. The amount of love that we were given, and I have to insist and underline this several times, the kind of benign neglect that we got. Oh. Very benign neglect. Gosh. It was wonderful because you were left to pursue your own imagination. We, the one thing that we were not allowed to do was to read, and my father for some reason said, don't read comics, it makes you lazy. <laughs> it makes you mentally lazy. We were not allowed to read Amar Chitra Katha or anything like that. Why? And I'm glad because Baba said, no, no, uh, don't read all that. Uh, read uh, children's Rama and children's Mahabharata. As a result, um, I never felt like watching Ramayana or Mahabharata on TV. And because why? Because when we were children, we each had a version of our own Sita, of our own Ravan, of our own Draupadi. But here, Rupa Ganguly was your Draupadi or somebody else was your Sita. You know, you, it had them imprinted on your mind. And then what happened was these things stripped the epics of all their metaphors yeah. and made them completely literal and made them naked and and boring and, boring and, um, and unattractive and gave rise to a kind of fundamentalism that we never were subjected to. And to this day, I hate that. To this day, I hate it. Well, thank you, Aparna. <laughs> thank you. Shabana, you know, all three of you shared that you've been particularly blessed for coming from such uh, liberated, evolved, you know, really elevated mindsets. 
many people don't come from that. And, and that's the question I was going to ask you, that if you were today to look around you and is there any aspect of feminism, you know, not as it pertains to the three of you, is there some aspect of feminism or that relationship between men and women today that bothers you, you know, beyond just the equality and inclusion, which of course is what it should be, but even about the way women are expressing themselves. For instance, Lilith has sp spoken about aspects of it that bother her, the conformism, the body culture, the buying into that. You were mentioning that you today actually look at yourself as in solidarity with a lot of other women's experiences. Are there aspects of it that bother you? That was one question. And the other is that the two of you are really close friends, but both of you are very, you know, feminist women, strong women coming from very liberal backgrounds. But are there essential ways in which both of you express your feminism very differently? Is she a very different woman from you? In fact, I feel that Aparna and I are very similar. And the reasons I really enjoy working with her when I did her film 15 Park Avenue, in so many ways I identified so strongly with the character that I played. She was a working woman, she was a caregiver, but she was not the sacrificing kind of person. I mean, she used to bitch and moan and get angry and be um, irritated with that, but also very, very caring. I think because we are, uh, we come from an urban milieu, we come from, um, what should I say, um, a cultural milieu which is uh, similar, etc. In a lot of way, I think uh, we are similar. How dissimilar we are, I don't, I don't really know. But what I would like to say is the notion of feminism as uh, being absorbed by some of the younger generation today, I think it's also a factor of age. Maybe, uh, you know, when they grow up more, they'll realize that it needs to change. But for instance, there is a literally literalness to the idea of what feminism is. I was just telling them this afternoon that once we were in um, America and I was ironing Javed's kurta and uh, a friend of mine walked in and said, you're ironing Javed's kurta and you call yourself a feminist. Now, what does it have to do with feminism is what I want to know. So this literally, does he iron your kurta? I said, no, I won't allow him because he'll burn it. You know, <laughs> so just because I am doing it for it doesn't mean that he has to... Uh, do it. Is tarah ki jo literalness ki maine tumhare liye ye kiya to tum exactly wo hi mere liye kiya. I think it also comes from young for being uh, young and a lot of uh, young girls today very easily wanting to give up on their relationship because divorce is no longer um, a taboo word. Now although personally I feel that to keep the, the pressure to keep the marriage alive under all circumstances is truly frightening because oftentimes it lets, it forces girls into what are unhappy marriages. And then you say, does he beat you? No. Does he take away your money? No. But there is something else that is making me unhappy. What is that? That indefinable quality. How can you want to give up on a marriage like that? So I think this pressure to keep the marriage alive, that's... Uh, not good. I also feel that it is very necessary that parents keep their doors open for their daughters just as much as they do for their sons. That's very, very important because otherwise where does she go? There is no state help and that makes her continue to be in, in a violent or an unhappy uh, situation. So that bothers me a little bit, but like I said, I feel that as they grow up, they will realize that there is a change over there. Now I feel, um, you know, I, um, my parents had a very good marriage. I have a very good uh, marriage. And uh, so I find marriage a very nurturing and a very beautiful thing. It happens if you have a good relationship. But I think in the man-woman equation, what is very important is that what is it that bothers women really? The fact that when she has a child, then there is a period when she's at the peak of her career that she has to give up for the child. That I think needs to be shared with the, the man. If he starts participating in that, 
then really there is something that very beautiful can come out of it. So in that man-woman relationship, instead of just saying that no, it's at the exclusion of the man, what we need to say is no, you come along in this particular period of my life, I need help and you, and I've seen the younger men particularly today, they are doing that and that is really making the experience much happier. Shibana, you know, uh, when you did Fire, which was about a lesbian relationship, apparently you did um, pause before you made that decision. What troubled you about that? You know, so is your liberalness, does it stop just short of lesbianism and, and gay relationships, at least in your personal life? And did that film change your value system in some way? What was that hesitation about and what made you overcome it? Uh, I work in the slums and uh, I am not, uh, I'm not a believer. And I work with a lot of poor women who find it very difficult to come along with me because their husbands tell them, She's not a good woman, you shouldn't go with her. So I have faced that battle. Now I felt that if I did this film, it would of course be controversial and it would affect that section of society because now women, uh, that section of men would say, see we told you that she is a bad woman, you shouldn't have it. So it was that consideration more than anything else. But ultimately, what made me do the film is because I feel that, you know, when you, uh, if through that film, you can empathize with the other, the other woman, the other gender, the other race, the other nationality, then you are, instead of, what we do is we shun the other. Because we don't know the other, so we are either terrified or we shun it. But if you embrace them and you talk about an issue, which otherwise you say that, no, it doesn't exist at all. That, and the conviction that I had that, um, that Deepa would treat it sensitively, that she wouldn't do it in a vicarious. Because see, the business of cinema is the business of images. And how you create those images is responsible for your niyat. And I knew that his niyat was okay. But after I did that film, I was embraced by the gay and lesbian community in a way that made me almost feel that I had to align myself with them which at that moment I was not comfortable with. I have to be honest about it because I didn't, uh, I, you know, if I'm doing something that I'm concerned with at that point, I didn't want to be part of that. But over the years, you feel really happy when people come up to you and tell you, you know, you gave us so much courage, that film gave us so much courage. So that film actually gave me the courage to also embrace something that I was a bit uncomfortable with that. And I think that's the most beautiful thing. That's the most beautiful thing about cinema and being an actor because it gives you the chance to inhabit a world that you don't necessarily understand fully and then that adds to your experience. So Lilith, let me come to you because I wanted to speak a little bit about your creative canvases and you know creative dilemmas or like uh, Shabana just mentioned about how fire shifted the boundary for her. Has there been you know, works in your life the plays you've done or the films you've done, which are very disparate actually, the plays you pursue and the films you pursue are very different. But, you know, uh, we had Nasiruddin Shah here some weeks ago and he picked, I was asking him to pick a role that really cut close to the bone, that really mattered to him. And it's surprising, he picked a very small cameo role in Khuda Ke Liye, where he plays the Malvi's part. And he said it was like the moment of his lifetime to be able to say those things that the Malvi says because he'd been waiting to say that all his life. Has anything like that happened to you? Is there any play that cuts deep to your bone, your personal bone? Uh, and the second question I'd like to ask you is that have you ever faced a dilemma mm -hmm. as a woman, you know, where just to express yourself as a woman or have you had ethical conflict about how to play yourself out as a woman? So the creative question and, and the dilemma of being a woman. You know, firstly, my, I keep my theater life and my film life, unlike Shabana, very different. I mean, very separate rather. Uh, I'm, I'm, my, I'm heart and soul in love with the theater. 
for me, I joined films uh, strangely at a very strange time, which can just show you that life never stops and is full of surprises if you turn the corner, like in The Best Exotic Marigold. And I joined films at 47. So when, you know, most women are packing their makeup bags and saying bye-bye and going home. And there I trot along and uh, I said, okay, why not try this? So I've enjoyed it because it has given me an opportunity to work with some terrific actors and in some terrific films with some terrific directors, Meera, Panna, and many, many more. Uh, but it's always been a parallel activity. And why I'm saying this is where I am totally free, because I also produce my own plays, is in the theater. And my intention, my raison d'etre to start a theater company was to do original Indian writing you know, whether in Marathi or whatever, and do the kind of subjects that I'm interested in. Be, be it, as you said very correctly, I don't have any signature kind of work that I do. I could explore Zen Buddhism, I could explore Gandhi's philosophy, I could explore sexual abuse. We did, by the way, the first ever play, uh, original play out of South Asia on homosexuality, way before fire, called On a Muggy Night in Mumbai. And we played it mainstream in Tata in front of 1,000 Parsi people who were very shocked that we were saying things like dick and all that on stage. And they were wondering, you know, what sort of a play was this? But they were sort of fascinated also. So, uh, you know, so I am a very restless artist, you know. Uh, you'll see it even in the small body of film work that I've done. I just can't be categorized and put into, uh, you know, I, I may not always follow, which I would love to, maybe a Shabana, to always do only the work that I truly feel uh, has value and everything I say in a film uh, is something I feel from the bottom of my heart, but I don't think I have the luxury of that kind of, uh, uh, you know, creative um, license. But in the theater, yes, everything I do is imbued with my passion. And like Aparna, I do it because I love that subject, I feel it's very important, and then I feel my passion has to somehow transmit itself to the audience, and I have to get the bums on seats. So that's my job. Even if I'm talking about something very, very uh, unusual, like Zen Buddhism, which how many people are interested in, but still I have to get people to come and see the play. So that has offered me both in terms of roles as an actor and a director, producer. That's why I won't let anyone sort of produce my work. Because I, I will take full responsibility. So which, which play do you... F uh, is there any no, play all that All the plays I have done have had some... See, Peter Brooks had said something very beautiful. He said, what you need really when you strip the theatre down, uh, and why that is why I love the theatre, is there is an actor, a light, and there is a person watching. And that's all it is. And you tell stories of shared experiences of us as humans. You know, we're, sh we're just human beings sharing stories, experiences, getting enriched, uh, enlivened, and illuminated. So, so, and what he said, which is very beautiful, is that when it's over, what are the ashes that remain? That's all it's all about. So for me, every play has to have those ashes. Whether it's about, we did a play on sexual abuse called 30 Days in September. Uh, it's a play which was a landmark for me. Of course, Dance Like a Man was too, but 30 Days was particularly interesting. It was an NGO from Delhi called Rahi, and they wanted Mahesh Datani to write a play. And I was shooting for Monsoon Wedding in Delhi, and he came and met me for a coffee, and he said, you know, they want me to write a play on sexual abuse, but you know, who's gonna be interested in a play about sexual abuse? I mean, who's gonna watch it? And what's the p r point of writing a play if no one's gonna see it? So I was, you know, blind. I said, I will do it. I have two daughters. I'm a woman, I will do the play. I don't even want to know what it's about. I thought I'd do 25 shows. I've done over 200 shows and it's one of my most appreciated and popular plays. So, and I think the wonderful thing about the theater is that you come from a very pure place. You know, you just, you just want to make that, a play says to me, do me. I need to be done. And that's all it is. I never think anyone's going to come, not come. I just need to do it. So. So many are those plays. I did a play called Sami, which was about the space between, a space which is never explored in Gandhi's life. How did he come to these out of box solutions like Satyagraha and non violence and et cetera, et cetera? So it's played out by, and it was written by Pratap Sharma, brilliant, brilliantly written play, where Gandhi and his alter ego have these debates, discussions where the alter ego teases him, scolds him, abuses him you know, and makes him, and he keeps saying, I'm just a man, I'm just an ordinary man. He said, you're not an ordinary man. There is more to you than that. So 
I mean, these are not easy subjects for a general janta to say wah wah kind of thing, you know. So I've done all kinds of things. My latest plays on Gohar Jan. So when I was doing it, and very often, Kanya Dan by Vijay Tendulkar, the Dalit and Brahmin sort of conflict, people have always said to me, Are, who's interested in these plays, yaar? I mean, Dalit and Brahmin, and this Gohar Jan singing, singing Thumris in 1902, so boring, so boring, that I can cross a couple of hundred shows with these plays is a big affirmation for me to carry on and do that kind of work. In so cinema, I can't do it, you know? It's, it's not my vision, it's not my subject. And uh, so, but I've tried to do a range. I've not always done something that I feel completely impassioned and believe in. I mean, I can do a Kalwana Ho, but I can do a My Brother Nikhil, because I believe in My Brother Nikhil. I can do a Best Exotic, but I can also do a Bagban or a smaller film, which has, say, a lunchbox where yeah. I just did it for, for a Believe in the Movie. So my film career, I take as something I do to have fun, to work with some brilliant people, but my heart, where I do, what I really feel, and creatively, frankly, there is no comparison. I don't think cinema has given me anything where I've had to even do this much, stretch myself even this much, and this is the honest truth. <laughs> Not you got to much. act okay. opposite <laughs> Richard Gere. <laughs> Theatre didn't That's give okay. you that. That was a different kind of experience. <laughs> this is this is called Lilith's desire for suicide. You know, <laughs> she's sitting next to Aparna and Shabana and saying. Films are just, just not the medium. You know? It's not. For an actor, <laughs> even Shabana will tell you, and at some level, even Reena will tell you. Okay. Because they've both been actors. Okay, we're, we're running out of time, and uh, there's just so much we haven't covered. Uh, I'm just going to come to you, Aparna. Forgive me again for entering the personal, but, you know, we, again, on stage, one is always presenting the self confident and the successful and the beautiful and the gorgeous. Uh, you've already shared one vulnerability. Lilith had asked you for that, but I'm going to skip to Aparna now. That, again, about this thing about managing relationships, Aparna, you've been through two marriages. Looking back, you know, since we're discussing the whole female-male dynamic, what was it in the first marriage that did not work and what is it that works in the second marriage? Is it you that's changed or is it the texture and uh, power equation in the, in the marriages that changed? You know, I don't like discussing the personal at this level because um, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to be completely objective. Because I can only give you my side of it. I mean, it is not fair if my ex-husbands cannot give their side of it. That's very, very important. Um, having said that, um, I think uh, it is very difficult for a successful woman to find a man who is comfortable with her success. It is difficult. And you know, my uh, first husband, who uh, has passed on long back, when I think about him now, I see a very young, very vulnerable person that I now want to protect. You know, I feel... He didn't realize at that time what he was doing. He hadn't matured enough. I hadn't matured enough. And now, when he's almost the age of my son, when he died, I think, you know, why couldn't I, with my present state of maturity, have been there for him? You know, because one of the things that, to me, is the most important quality in the world, and one that turns me on in a man and also in women, is compassion. I mean, this is something that I rate above anything else in the world. Really, I do. And I should have been there for them. I couldn't deal with alcoholism. I never, to my deep regret, questioned or was able to deal with what drove them to alcoholism? Was I responsible? Could I have done something to prevent it? All this plagues me now, but then I have to move on. I can't dwell in the past always. And I'm very, very deeply happy that, and I'm very proud of Mukul Sharma, that he was able to get over his alcoholism. And he's married a wonderful woman called Benita. And I have been to their home. I have had dinner with them, danced, had a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I 
they are full of goodwill towards me and I'm full of goodwill towards them. So that is there. But, what, you know, there's a woman called Chandralekha. She also was a woman, a wonderful dancer called Chandralekha. When she heard of my third marriage, she called me up and she said, Aparna, when will you ever learn? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I started laughing. And then later I thought about it, you know, and I thought, why is it? Why is there this need to get married? Maybe I come from the generation of women who believed in marriage. But you know, am I an incorrigible romantic who believes, yes, there can be a successful marriage in spite of success? Can I find a man who is, doesn't have a fragile ego, you know, who can deal with my success? I still think, and I think I'm maybe too idealistic, but I still think that ideally, if you have the ideal situation, that a man and a woman can complete each other. I really do think so. You know, that's, that's almost too perfect as, a, as the director of this particular film. I have to stop at that moment, you know. <laughs> it's to speak to three women, three feminists, for me at least, you know, we're going to open this up to the audience, but for me, what has been the most reaffirming part of uh, this entire evening is to hear the respect with which you've spoken of everyone in your lives, your wives, your partners, your ex-partners, the ones who failed you and who didn't. And that, you know, when you really zeroed in on it, Aparna, the idea of compassion, you know, I think that could reside in a man, it could reside in a woman, but it is truly the only feminine quality that this world really needs is the idea of compassion. Thank you so much for sharing so much of yourselves with us. No, wait, wait, wait. We're going to open it up to the audience. <laughs> they weren't expecting that much applause. <laughs> Let's open this up. Um, again, we're not doing it through the screen. So first question, anybody raise their hands right here. I think I've earned this question. Uh, I came and sat here because uh, I was trying to marry in my head the session we went through first and the second session, it wasn't no accident that nature was called mother nature. And uh, I sat with a particular deliberate thought. I thought I would sit in front of four way accomplishment, accomplished women. Uh, and that'll be my way of being able to pay respect to the mother, the nature. And yet, what provoked me to walk from the bar to here is uh, when I could sort of sense uh, gender overpowering everything else. Uh, my question is, uh, if you were to just rise up about, above this trivia, Don't you all, don't we all have to rise above all this and sort of say compassion? All of you spoke and we finished uh, tonight, four of you, that if anything could, compassion could drive us along. So we got to sort of get over this trivia. So, how so do your, you your, qu your, qu your My question, question is. How would you just sort of leave the trivia aside? And the trivia of gender. No, well, I mean, that's a very valid question. The, just to, just to uh, speak of why so much of my questioning of them was focused on the idea of being women was partly because the film is about women's friendship. But I, it is a very valid question that, especially in 2017, with many battles having been fought in our class of people, is the idea of gender too dominating, uh, dominating our conversation too much? Is there other ways of approaching the conversation about men and women than strictly through the prism of gender? Would you like me to answer? Well, you know, in spite of everything, in spite of, you know, India resides, our country, our beloved country, resides in many time frames at the same time. 
there are parts of India that would be in the 22nd century perhaps, and there are parts that live maybe in the 18th. What happens is that you can't wish away gender in a society that's still deeply entrenched in patriarchy. We speak as empowered, successful women, but we have sisters who are not empowered, who are not successful. We have sisters who are abused regularly. We have sisters who are raped. And then there should be justifiable anger. There has to be justifiable anger. You can't rise above gender then. And, and I think uh, one more thing, which again came home from speaking to all these three women, is that they're coming from an environment where opportunity and the, yes. the, you know, exactly the question you're asking that where they were ungendered because their fathers and their mothers did not see them as girls, but they, were, they had that right, they had that opportunity to be highly individual. And I think that's what we're all battling for, you know, a world where all of us don't even have to be imprisoned into what a woman should be like and what a man should be like, but that we are allowed to be highly individual. And I think that's what they, all three of them represent uh, today, the, the right to be individual and the right to choose. Um, another question there. You know, uh, I want to narrate an incident to you where I was uh, um, asking a broker to look for a house for my brother a while back. So I called up the broker a few days later. He told me, he just called me up a few days later, so I'll look for a house for him. So a um, few days later, I asked him, Ki, Bhaiya, makan mila? He said, actually, I'm very busy, hu, uh, I've come to Ramli Ramlila Grounds. So I said, Ramlila Grounds, why are you He said, uh, isli aaya hu, kyunki hum yahan par, jo hoti hai na, the cow, the cow. I said, what, the cow? He said, haan, jo gai hoti hai na, gai. Gai mata ko hum rash mata ka darza dene ke liye aaye hai yahan par. I said, uh, uh, one second, uh, bhaiya, aisa hai ki, rash pita to ek aadmi hai, to rash mata bhi ek aurat honi chahiye, nahi? He said, nahi, nahi, madam, aisa nahi hai, aisa nahi ho sakta. Because a woman can only be a child's mother, and a woman can't be a child's mother. So can I ask you one thing? I mean, when you're talking about, uh, when you say that something is trivia, gender is not trivia. Gender is the main issue, and we have to talk about it the way Aparna has done, the way Shabana has done, and the way Lilit is doing. I'm really happy that you've made this film. Thank you. Thank you. It's good that you're still seated there, you know. <laughs> Physically, it's just perfect. No, 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 no. We realize where you're coming from. Just kidding. <laughs> but that's still a long way away, you know. Okay. I, truly, I realize where you're coming from. But it's a long way away. It's a dream that we have, that we will rise above gender. Any other questions? Yeah, there's a question geographically at the back. Jack. I remember reading, my name is Lali Sahani. I remember reading a quote once which said that women who compete with men lack ambition. And with all humility at my command, with all the men present here, we concede defeat. You guys are fantastic looking. You've done a great job. And, and Lilith, the next time if you're wanting to get married, give me a call, we'll go out for a cup of coffee. Love you. And I'm gonna go watch a movie too. And I saw a lot of very interesting, stimulating young women here, but you guys take the cake. God bless you. God bless you. Well, this is clearly going to be a session of compliments and not questions. <laughs> Does anybody have a question? Man there. Sorry, I can't see you in the... Yeah. Uh, one commonality which I heard in all three of you talking um, was it's very apparent that all your fathers were feminist. You know, they- Well they, said, well yeah. said. And I, uh, I wonder what you would say if a person, a man says that I'm a feminist, I feel like that, I think like that. What would you say would be the asset test for such a person? What would be one thing that you would say, and maybe each one of you can say one different thing, you know. What's that? Uh, you know, we couldn't quite hear that at the end, what did you say is the acid test? Uh, the acid test for a man. What, to, be a to, be a to be a feminist. Uh, what is the acid test that makes a man a feminist?
what makes a man a feminist? What's of <laughs> no that I'll that I'll uh, then I'll give it to you. You know I think that we are so deeply entrenched in a patriarchal mindset that men are as much victims of patriarchy as women are. Absolutely. And I think when we can shake that off, that is what a feminist would be, whether man or woman. I totally agree. I totally agree about that. And I just wanted to give a small example um, of a film that was made in early 70s by Shrutujit Rai. It's called Mohanagur, which means the big city. And there, the woman has come out to work, not because she's trying to be a feminist or assert her right to work or anything like that, but mainly because the family just needs more income, which is what happened after the Second World War. Now, she goes to work somewhere, and gradually she gains in confidence. Earlier, she was very frightened. And an Anglo-Indian girl works there. And she notices the discrimination against the Anglo-Indian girl. And when the Anglo-Indian girl is sacked, this Bengali woman of uh, ordinary middle class, she resigns in protest. I, I thought that was so brilliant because we have, you know, feminist films of a woman trying to reach her potential or, or, or fighting for herself and her rights. But here she's taking a moral, ethical decision on behalf of another. And then her husband loses his job in the bank when the bank fails and comes and says, you know, don't, don't, I had asked you to quit the job, but don't quit the job because I've lost mine. And she looks at him aghast and she says, I've just quit my job, you know. And then they're looking at each other and then he says, um, it's such a big city. Won't one of us find a job? I'm sure we will. And that, won't one of us find a job? The fact that they share <laughs> equally. And this was made in the early 70s, which is what, you know, really inspires me. All this talk of what clothes I should wear, what clothes I shouldn't wear. Okay, sure. By all means, celebrate your femininity, your sensuality. But that's not what it's all about. That's not what it's all about. In fact, today, feminism has broadened. It's broadened its spectrum to include almost all people who are marginalized. You know, it's no longer that brand of feminism, which was very necessary then. But is, you know, we've come beyond that now. Thank you. Aparna, as the true director, you always know the perfect moment at which to stop. You know, no, I'm saying you always give the perfect line on which to stop. Uh, again, just, just to at least sum up my takeaway that what's been wonderful is that it's not just success. Yes, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I, I think it's very, very simple. If a man can make a woman feel when he's with her, when he talks to her, that he is not aware of her, uh, aside from the fact, okay, you will say, you know, she's attractive, etc., etc. that there is anything to do with gender here. We're just talking as two human beings. We're talking as two people. And if he can defend a woman, as she was talking about, a woman defending another woman, could defend another woman, enter her world, defend her in front of other men, I think with other men, men become very, very male. And uh, for me, a feminist would be if somebody could stand up to me and just address me or talk to me absolutely as if I had no other gender. We were of this, we had the same gender, which is very difficult for a man to do. He's not able to overcome that. So, you know, I <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, I, th I, I, I'm not saying that I don't want to be made aware as a woman that I'm a woman. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about when they talk to you, there are there is a sort of a unwritten thing of some kind of superiority which exists on on some level. It's not they're not even aware of it, and it is there in most men. Um, 
and, and the things that the subjects they feel you do not understand and they would not talk to you about them. It's implicit in, in the way they talk to you. So I think that getting rid of that is a very, very difficult thing. For instance, my father could, would never do that. He never felt any subject was such that you could not understand it. You were not capable of understanding it. You know, you're dumbing the person down who you're talking to, you're assuming that. So I'm talking about that. Okay, I understand what she's talking about. But for a moment I said, you know, if a man is not aware of my gender, then that's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, even at this age, want men always to be aware of my gender. And, and I will say, I don't want them to consider me an inferior. Of course I don't. Most of the time, they are frightened because they think of me as superior. <laughs> but, 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 but really, I would say it's, it would be such a boring world if there were no difference between men and women and vive la difference. Yes. Please, vive let's have difference. a difference and let's be attractive to each other and respectful of each other. Wonderful. Aparna, absolutely. You know, the, the one thing that flowed through this conversation is the absence of dominance. You know, you, the absence of dominance, whether it's from a man or from a woman, uh, and, that, and that wonderful individuality that all of you have spoken of, you know. And yet again, for me, the most inspiring aspect of this evening was that the three of you women whether you embody feminism or not, is that you're successful, you're wonderfully gorgeous, but you're also various and you're vulnerable. And I think that that capacity to embody both success and vulnerability and to share that with us has really epitomized what for me is to be a woman, is to look for that uh, capacity for compassion, dialogue and absence of dominance. And thank you for embodying that and for being with us today. So ladies and gentlemen, in another week on 21st, Sonata releases and let's continue to celebrate Aparna Sen, Shabana Azbi and Lilith by making it a box office hit. Thank you very much for being here.